Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm uh, very pleased to, to be here this afternoon to, um, to sort of round off um, what, what has been a, a really interesting um, symposium about an issue that is, is so very, very important, I think. I've been working in the, the field of autism for around 30 years now. And I think, for me, the key thing, there have been so many changes, particularly around children's services. Um, as Pat said earlier, we've seen some fantastic um, uh, moves forward as far as our knowledge and our practice are around services for children, and to some extent for services for, for adults. But the key question that I was always asked when I started in this field 30 years ago by parents was, what's going to happen when I'm no longer here? And we've seen these great changes. In the UK, we've got an Autism Act, which I never believed I would, would see. I mean, that was beyond my wildest dreams. We've got an autism strategy, and yet, when I meet parents, Still the question that they ask is, what's going to happen when I'm no longer here? So for individual families, sadly, that, that hasn't changed. And, and even more sadly, some of the, the older parents that I, I know well, whose children have, have passed away, they have said to me, the one thing that means is that I don't have the worry about um, what's going to happen when I'm no longer here. And I do think that's, that's a very sad indictment of, of us as a society. Um, just before I move on, I'd just like to, to, to mention my colleague, uh, Dr. Jo, uh, Gina Gomez de la Cuesta, who, who led this piece of work. Um, it's, it's nice to know as, as we're all here talking about the, the older generation um, of people with autism, she's, she's busy trying to make the new generation in that she's, uh, she, she's um, due to, to give birth within the next uh, month. So, so I'm uh, taking over from her on that. Okay. And um, what I want to talk about this afternoon is just to look at some of the, the key issues around autism and aging. I want to talk about the findings from a survey that, that we undertook in the UK recently. And, um, and I want to talk about some of the practical uh, measures that, that we've put into place within the services of the National Autistic Society to try to help us to be able to respond to the needs of older adults with autism. Okay, so, so some of the things that we know and, and have, have, have already been discussed this afternoon. We know there are many older adults with, with autism who are either undiagnosed and, and, or misdiagnosed. And, and um, one of the key things for me, I, I was at the, the Women in Autism Symposium um, yesterday, and I do think we've, we've probably got quite a large cohort of older women who, who have had misdiagnosis in, in the past. Anecdotally, I hear from clinicians an awful lot of um, women in their 40s, 50s, uh, and 60s who are, who are um, learning about autism and, and coming for a diagnosis. And I think we, th there may be a, a group out there that we're not very good at, at recognizing. So what services do people need as they, as they age? We know that health and social care services are not geared up to meet the needs of older people with ASD. In the UK, we've had a lot of work recently looking at how they can meet the demographics of, of, of the non-disabled um, group. And I think this is, this is a, a, a further concern. So how do service providers respond to this need? Now, this is going to be a problem because I need to do a lot of clicks here. <laughs> so we need, whoops. Right. Well, what do we need to find out? What is life like now for older people with autism? Are there any different health problems? Are there health problems that are more common? Is life expectancy any different? Do the characteristics of, of people with autism um, change as they age? 
Um, both, both of my colleagues have spoken about the fact that we don't know, is dementia more common? We know a little bit about Down syndrome and dementia, but we don't know about autism and, and dementia. How do we recognize it? What support do we need to put in? And, and what about people who are not known to services? People who actually have done okay so far. And I think of a, a, um, someone that I, I have known for, for many, many years who has survived really quite well through adulthood, has held down a job, um, he's in his 50s, and he had a fall recently, um, and he, he broke his wrist. But as his life had been held together through a, a framework of regularity, of the same um, things happening at the same time, of people that, that, that knew him through routines, and this, in fact, completely um, blew his routines. His whole, the framework under his life fell, fell apart. Um, he ended up sectioned um, in, in a great, enormous amount of distress. And on coming out, wasn't able to get any support at all because he was seen as someone who was very able because he had worked. So there is something about people who aren't in any system and how do we, how do we get them into the system into when they're in older age? A couple of years ago, we, we undertook a campaign at the National Autistic Society to try to improve services and support for, for adults. And as part of that, the, the information that we <coughs> drew together for that campaign, we, we asked 1,787 adults about their lives. So that's 18 years and older, either through di a direct questionnaire or through their families. Of those respondents, 34% um, were, were 40 years and older. So we, we actually got quite a chunk. We weren't asking them speci questions specifically about older age, but we did manage, we did recognize that there was this cohort within the, the survey. And 4% and of those were 65 years or over. And if my memory serves me right, we were looking at um, around 80 people. 60% were single and 80% lived in England. So we looked at, at some of the, where, where they were living, what their, their, um, their lives looked like. Fewer 40 year olds lived with parents, as you would expect, but not as many as you would expect. Uh, sorry, as, as few as you would expect. Um, more lived alone or lived in their own house without support um, and, and, and more of the very older age group, 65 and over, lived in a, a, a group home. Of those who lived in their own flat or their own house, we asked well, who, who actually provides their support. Um, as you can see, still a very large number whose support came from their family. Um, similar number who, who didn't have any support, and only quite a small number who, whose support came from a professional carer, none um, that, that came from friends. Um, but it is interesting, it does tie in very much with, with what Pat was saying, is that many of this older age group are still very reliant on their, their family, mainly parents, sometimes siblings. And this is just a, a, a quote from um, Digby Tantum who said he's very concerned about what happens to older people with, with Asperger's syndrome in the community, particularly those who have lost contact with family members. And we've seen that an awful lot in our services. Um, he says he believes many may simply die through preventable diseases, consequence of malnourishment or poor housing. We go back to the question that I started with um, about asking parents, are you worried about your, your child's future? Interestingly, the older age group were, families were less worried ab about them, but we were still, we are still talking across the adult spectrum, a very large number of family members who don't feel real confidence in the way that their grown up child will be supported when, when they are no longer there.